Greetings, everyone. I am Lotus Prince. I have been a fan of the Resident Evil series for a very long time, but one thing that I did not know until I did my research was just how many times the game has been ported outside of its original PlayStation release. Now, what I found interesting about these ports is that they're not all just copy-paste jobs. In many cases, there are actual unique content differences among the various versions of the game. So what I'm going to do right now is talk about as many of those as I can across every release of the original Resident Evil, and even its remake that came out many years later. Now I'm not going to go very much into technical details unless something very noticeably stands out, but I'm rather going to stick with actual in-game content. So with that said, let us begin. We will start, of course, with the original PlayStation release. The game was given artificial difficulty in the West in two ways. First, there is no auto-aim. You have to manually turn to face your enemies, which can be difficult because of the tank controls. You either have to run in an arc or stand still and pivot. In addition, when you pick up an ink ribbon, you get two in your inventory. Meanwhile, the Japanese release had both auto-aim and three ink ribbons per pickup. That takes care of the added content. Now we can discuss what was changed or outright taken away. For starters, we can take a look at when you prepare to start a game. In the Japanese release, the game directly labels Chris as hard and Jill as easy. Western players had to find this out for themselves during gameplay. Next, we can observe the iconic intro. As it turns out, the West got a censored release. The narration is intercut with shots of newspaper clippings. The Japanese version, however, was more morbid, showing corpses instead. When the movie focuses on the main characters, there's an extended scene of Joseph being killed off by dogs. Also, one major difference is the presentation of Chris in the cast of characters. In the Western release, he's shown in multiple different clips. This is noticeable because none of the other characters has that strange bit of editing. This is because in the original Japanese release, he stayed in the same shot like everyone else, but was lighting a cigarette. This had to be changed in the West so as not to promote smoking. The same logic applies to Chris's worst ending. In Western releases, he's shown sitting in a helicopter and looking disappointed, but in the Japanese version, he lights and smokes a cigarette. In addition, the Japanese version sticks with English audio here and through the rest of the game, with Japanese subtitles. I don't know what happened! There's also a slight difference between the Japanese and Western soundtracks. The opening and ending themes are different. Chris Redfield Got a shotgun. Chris Redfield. For another bit of censorship, there's Kenneth's dead body in the first CG scene of the game. In the Japanese release, you see his head fall off. A final piece of censorship that Japan didn't have to worry about is the ending credits, when you beat the game after having unlocked the rocket launcher. You're treated to a montage of characters and enemies being violently killed. The last thing that the Japanese original has that the other versions don't is images of what you're reading when you pick up text files. Other releases just have a black background. The original release of Resident Evil certainly is a classic, but did you know that there were earlier builds of the game, including a full-fledged Japanese demo? Let's take a look. The first thing you'll notice is the character selection. While you can highlight Chris or Jill, only Chris is playable. Like in the full Japanese release, the intro and scene with Kenneth are uncut, and the game is subtitled in Japanese and voiced in English. Alpha Team is flying around the forest zone, situated in northwest Raccoon City. A big difference, though, is the timer that starts as soon as the game shows its character models. It counts up, but make no mistake, it's not keeping score for bragging rights. You have 15 minutes to complete the demo. Kind of. 
The timer doesn't pause for dialogue scenes, but it does go away for door loading screens, FMV scenes, and any time you manage your inventory. This means on the pause menu or when using a storage box. Therefore, you can enter the status screen to collect your thoughts if you're trying to think of where to go next. Despite this concession, 15 minutes of being able to run around is still really tight, considering that the demo encompasses the entire first part of the game. Up to where you use the crests to open the door to the guardhouse. Only three crests, though, not four like in the final release. It's possible to make it there, but it's tough. If you do, or if you run out of time, then you'll get a message saying that the demo is over. Of course we're here to see what the demo has to offer, and it definitely has some unique tweaks. One of the first things to notice is that the wooden emblem isn't over the fireplace. Instead, in the room where you normally get the map of the mansion's first floor, the statue is holding the emblem instead of the map. This means that the puzzle involving pushing the stairs to the statue is mandatory. The ink ribbon in the back is worth only one as well. Not that it matters, as you can't save, because this is a demo. A message tells you this at the typewriter in the room where you meet Rebecca, but there isn't a typewriter at all in the room with the chemical herbicide or in the main entrance. Speaking of the main entrance, the act of climbing the stairs is a bit different. You still get a loading screen, but there's a bit of Chris doing his gameplay walk first, and the transition into the stairs loading screen goes more quickly than the one in the final game, as you're no longer starting at the foot of the stairs. As for other minor differences, when you put the gold emblem over the fireplace, the clock strikes once instead of three times like in the full game. Also, there's no music during the yawn fight. There are bigger changes, though. For one, in the room where you have to move the two statues to block the poison gas fence, there's now a third statue of a different color in the middle of the room to serve as a minor obstacle. In the bathroom, draining the tub yields some handgun ammo instead of an old key. For the real big stuff, though, there are two things, both in the same area. The first is in the room with the herbicide. As you approach it, you'll hear footsteps above. Upon leaving, you'll find that a zombie has come downstairs and is waiting for you. This was removed from the final game, and nothing like it would be seen until the advanced mode of the director's cut, where some zombies would open doors and enter rooms at scripted times. Finally, one other thing that never made it to the final product is right upstairs where the zombie came from. On a wall by the door leading to the outer hallway is a message written in blood. Upon investigating it, you'll see. A message is written. Breathing is painful. Someone stop this suffering. It's almost like a prototype of the famous Dog Keeper Diary, logging his slow transformation into a zombie and culminating in itchy tasty. This is all well and good for an official product that predates the final game, but there are also some prototypes that we could take a look at. There are three prototypes for Resident Evil that I'm aware of. The first one is dated August 4th, 1995, and it seems to be for basic testing purposes. The title screen looks different from what the final product is, and you can only select Chris. His picture is a drawing of the character, rather than a depiction of the actor from the opening FMV that we get in the final product, and there is no audio when you select him to start the game. The only track in the majority of the game is the one that plays when you solve the paintings puzzle to get the Windcrest in the official release. And there is no voice acting, except for cries of pain when you get hurt or die. <coughs> These seem to be Japanese voices, too, as they don't match the ones that end up being in the final game. <coughs> you start in the main hall, without a cutscene, and can only access some of the rooms in the mansion. Upstairs is off-limits. There is no inventory screen, and running has changed. Instead of having a dedicated run button like every other release of Resident Evil, you instead double-tap forward. You may switch among being unarmed and having the knife, pistol, or shotgun. You do this with a simple press of a button, and the weapons change in your hand, on screen. You also appear to have infinite ammo and health. As for the knife, there is no ready position when you're ready to strike. 
you simply press the attack button and stab. Camera angles are different in some rooms, like the dining room, which doesn't have the clock ticking, by the way. And there are even zombies positioned in that room. Also, even if you kill enemies, leaving and re-entering the room they were in will respawn them. The Kenneth hallway doesn't have his body, but it does have a hunter, which appears slightly different from how it looks in the final game. It also sounds different, with higher pitched screams. The statue room looks unfinished and lacks the movable stairs. The corridor on the back has a body that doesn't appear in the final game. The dog hallway has spiders instead of dogs. Some doors that would later require keys to unlock are already unlocked in this version. Most things cannot be interacted with, including the shelf in the piano room, though you can take the shotgun from the room past the crushing ceiling. Again, there's no inventory screen, so the object simply disappears to show that the trap exists. This means that you cannot put the shotgun back, but that's okay. Like in Jill's scenario in the official release, Chris is saved by Barry. In the released game, checking both doors will trigger this event for Jill. With Chris, he has to wait until the ceiling descends a certain amount, and then Barry opens the door and beckons him to leave. You have to actually leave yourself, unlike in the official release where that happens automatically. The scenario ends when you get past the door that you would normally unlock with crests. There isn't even a place to put them here, and Yawn appears in the room that would normally hold the square-shaped crank, with music that doesn't match his theme in the final product. Finally, the only way I'm aware of that you can die in this prototype is via the crushing ceiling. Should this happen, instead of, you died, written in blood, you get simple English text reading, game over, before the game resets. The second prototype is dated October 4th, 1995, and it definitely has some changes. The most immediately apparent one is that you can now select Jill, as well as Chris, and both of their pictures are drawings of the characters. In-game cutscenes, including the opening scene in the main hallway, plays out as normal, except that there's still no voice acting, so all you get is characters, gestures, and subtitles. The music is more normal as well. There is now an inventory screen, though it looks different from that of the final release. The character's profile pictures are different as well. Also, now that an inventory screen exists, weapons are now selected the normal way, rather than cycling through them with a button. Weapons now have ammo as well. As for the knife, it now requires a ready position to be used. The ready position, however, is quite different from what's in the final release, and takes longer to set up as well. There is now an appropriately placed zombie in the Kenneth hallway, but still no Kenneth or FMV scene. A magnum is quickly available downstairs, and the dressing room, normally a New Game Plus area, is unlocked, though nothing inside is usable. The early room with the statue has been slightly altered, but still looks unfinished, and does not contain the movable staircase to access the wooden emblem in the demo, or the map in the final release. The corpse in the back hallway has been removed. While a lot of enemies seem to be placed in locations where they would be in the official release, the dog hallway is still a spider hallway in this prototype. The shotgun can be removed from its stand to activate the crushing ceiling room, and now it actually goes into your inventory. The escape scene plays out normally, but again without voice acting. It is possible to go upstairs and check some areas there, like the dining room's upper balcony area and the room with Forrest's body. Regarding going upstairs, you don't have to press a button to go up. You automatically take a few in-game steps up the stairs, and then you segue into the transition screen. The final change is that dying now leads to the familiar, you died screen. The prototype ends the same way the earlier one did, with a hunter leading to the room that would normally hold the square crank, with Yawn attacking and leading to a to-be-continued message. The final prototype is labeled version 1-31, so I assume that that refers to January 31st, 1996. This is the full game, including cutscenes and voice acting, with surprisingly few differences from the official release. Barry! Where's Barry? One big difference, though, is that code is visible on every room transition screen. The statue room still has the wooden emblem, rather than the first floor map. Storage chests have a different sound when opened from the ones in the final release. The statue with the blue jewel is on the other side of the opening in the balcony, so you have to run past it and then push it backward. The dog keeper, rather than guarding shotgun shells, seems to have a map of the first floor of the mansion in his closet, but the prototype crashes when it's picked up, with a message that effectively translates to gibberish. 
One surprisingly convenient quirk is that when a key is used on every door it can open, it is automatically discarded, though it doesn't even give a message saying so. Normally you have to choose to discard a key once it's been used everywhere it can be. Like in the demo, there are only three crests required to open the door to the room with the square crank, rather than four. The wind crest is missing. The outside elevator transitions don't show the elevator going down, just a still of the controls. In the guardhouse, the red book room and its bathroom do not contain zombies. Picking up maps does not automatically take you to the map screen. Bullets don't appear to combine with each other on the item screen, so you'll need to arrange your inventory carefully. The billiard room contains a different track from what it has in the official release. Naked zombies appear in the mansion basement when normally they only exist in the endgame lab. The mansion's elevator battery appears in a secret room behind a bookcase rather than in the small room with ammo. One of the strangest changes is that this game has alternate magnum ammo. These are known as dum-dum bullets. They were supposed to deal less damage to bioorganic weapon enemies, or BOWs like the Hunters, but more damage to zombies and some bosses. My guess is that they were removed from the game because normal magnum ammo hits hard enough for bosses, and any magnum ammo type one-shot zombies anyway. Later, Enrico has the hex crank on him, rather than near the entrance of the room he's in. The first boulder in the cave is triggered automatically as you approach it, rather than after you investigate it and start to walk away. This makes it slightly harder to dodge than in the final release. Another strange change is that there is spare ammo for the flamethrower, so the flamethrower can be reloaded. The Doom Book in the cave requires not the hex crank to access, but the square crank. This is inconvenient, as it means you need special preparation for the cave with an item you thought you were done with by this point. The Endgame Lab has naked zombies eating a corpse. Normally they just stand around. There's also a naked zombie coming from a hole in the wall. Lastly, there is a debug menu that you can use to listen to dialogue. Who killed him, I wonder? teleport to certain rooms, and even adjust lighting. This is a very interesting product indeed. Sticking to PS1 releases, the next one to discuss is the Director's Cut, and it has made a lot of changes. The first is the Capcom logo at the very beginning. The old one was this. The new one is this. As far as the actual game goes, there's now an option to choose difficulty settings outside of the context of the characters. You have Standard Mode, which is the original Resident Evil experience. The Japanese experience, that is. You now have auto-aim and ink ribbon pickups are worth three, not two. Training mode provides you with more ammo and ink ribbons per pickup, and enemies do less damage, and take less damage before going down. Advanced mode is almost a whole other game. Camera angles have changed, some rooms have been retextured from before, item and enemy placement has changed, some enemies are faster, and you have a new white Beretta, which has a random chance to instantly decapitate zombies, like a shotgun can. Each character also begins the game with a brand new costume exclusive to this mode, and the closet is already unlocked. Instead of her casual outfit in the original release, Jill gets a police officer's clothes with a shirt with cut-off sleeves. Chris loses his outer shirt and wears a white undershirt, instead of his brown Made in Heaven jacket in the original version. Even Rebecca gets a new costume. Instead of her STARS medic uniform, she wears a red shirt and shorts with white outerwear. In addition, there are some scripted scenes where zombies open doors. And there's even a special scene with Forrest. Finally, if you beat advanced mode and save all of your partners to get the best ending, then you unlock a cult python with infinite ammo. If advanced mode proves too difficult, then there is a way to make it easier. When preparing to start a new game, highlight advanced difficulty and hold right on the D-pad until the word turns green. You will now receive double ammo with each pickup. Even if you own the original Resident Evil, the director's cut is worth picking up for advanced difficulty alone. After choosing difficulty, however, there are a few more things to notice. The first is that the Japanese release now uses the same intro and ending music as the Western releases. 
Chris Redfield. The second is that the box for the original U.S. release of the director's cut says, The Complete Uncut and Uncensored Resident Evil Cinemas. This is simply not true. The game is exactly as censored as it was before. The only exceptions to this rule that I've heard about are the French and German versions. Not only are these copies uncensored, but the intro cinematic is even in full color. However, this game is not available digitally. The PSN release is censored. If you want the uncensored version, then you'll have to find the disc. As for the American version, the information on its box may have been false, but the country would get an uncensored version of Resident Evil. However, we'll get to that subject a little later. For the next PlayStation release, though, let's take a look at the DualShock version. It's technically the greatest hits version of the director's cut, but it's not the same exact game. It now supports analog control in addition to the D-pad, and also the controller's rumble function. The game has somewhat increased difficulty in that enemies have more health and characters have less, and ink ribbon pickups are worth two again, but you do get to keep your auto-aim. However, advanced difficulty gives three ribbons again, and of course, training provides more as well. The most obvious thing about the game, though, is that it has an entirely reworked soundtrack. Taste in music is a matter of personal preference, but it's generally agreed upon that this change was for the worse. As far as I know, these are the only changes. If you wish to purchase these games online, then be aware of exactly what it is you're buying. The American PlayStation Network has the Greatest Hits version, which means that it has DualShock support, but a new soundtrack. Now, Europe never got this release of the game, so its PlayStation Network has the original director's cut. However, because it's in PAL territories, and PAL runs at 50Hz instead of NTSC's 60Hz, that means that if you do get the European release, you're going to be playing the game at 5 sixths of the intended speed. Now, if you want full speed, and original director's cut, you can get the Japanese version, but of course the text will be in Japanese. So if you ever want to really confirm what it is you're getting, if you want the original American director's cut, for example, then you'll need the disc. Now that said, those are really the main differences I'm aware of. DualShock support, and new soundtrack. Now, that covers it for the PlayStation releases. Now let's get to something of an oddball. The Sega Saturn release. One of the first things to notice is that it seems to be a port of the original American release, as ink ribbon pickups are worth only two instead of three, and it lacks auto-aim. The control menu is also different from those of other releases to correspond to the Saturn controller. Another thing that stands out is the game's technical aspects. Door loading screens take a bit longer than in other releases. FMV cutscenes also take a little while to load, and it takes a little while to go back to gameplay when a cutscene ends. However, as the Saturn normally uses internal memory rather than a memory card, saving is noticeably faster than on the other releases. When saving, if you wish to overwrite a file, rather than create a new one, the option says Update instead of Overwrite. Despite what I said about memory cards earlier, you have the option of choosing to save to the system itself or to a memory cartridge that goes into the system's cartridge slot. As for presentation, textures of things like doors and some objects have changed. During the loading screens, doors are presented in 320 by 240 resolution, as opposed to the PlayStation 640 by 480. Some objects, like the dining room clock, look worse than before. Character and enemy models seem to have better textures, though they also look blockier than on the PS1. One definite downside, though, is transparency. The Saturn doesn't appear to be able to handle that effect very well. Gun smoke looks grainy, and water effects are quite conspicuous, from the fountain the dangerous plant grows out of to the area you need to drain with a square crank. After this, though, we can get to some of the stranger aspects of the game. The panic music that comes up in places such as when dogs burst through the first floor hallway sounds a bit different from that of the other releases. Crow 
sound different too. Speaking of crows, one of the rooms they can be found in has a puzzle where you need to press buttons on paintings that depict a person in consecutive stages of life, culminating in a picture of death, which is labeled the end of life, at least in the PS1 version. On the Saturn, the picture instead says, give me the peace of death and I'll give you the joy of life. I'm not sure why this difference exists, as the point of the whole thing isn't changed. I guess it's the difference between simply saying that it's the end, rather than directly telling the player what to do, but the change mostly seems cosmetic. Speaking of cosmetic changes, there's a new enemy in the cave area. Kind of. Something called a Tick has replaced the hunters there. Hunters are still in the mansion, but in the caves you deal with Ticks instead. They function exactly like hunters, but they look and sound different. Probably the most interesting part about the normal game content, though, is toward the end. After Wesker gives his big speech, you have to fight the Tyrant in the lab. In the Saturn version, though, there's a twist, but only if you play as Chris. After taking the Tyrant down, what should show up? A second Tyrant. Yes, you actually have to deal with two of these things. It's a fantastic gotcha moment for players who played the PS1 version first and thought that they knew everything there was to know. After beating the game, it's possible to unlock alternate costumes for Chris and Jill. These costumes are exclusive to the Saturn version. Jill gets a green beret, shoulder gear, and pants, and Chris gets a blue outfit with body armor. What's also interesting is that it's possible to unlock the costumes the very first time you turn the game on, with a push-button code. During the opening cutscene, when it says July 1998, hold L and R on controller 2, and then press start on controller 1. Your character will be wearing the new costume when the game begins. The final major thing to bring up for the Saturn release is an entirely new mode of gameplay, Battle Mode. This is unlocked when you beat the game. However, you can also unlock it with a push button code. Hold X, Y, and Z on the second controller and press Start on the first controller. You must have save data for this to work though, as Battle Mode is accessed by loading. It plays kind of like the one in Resident Evil Code Veronica. You have to make your way through a predetermined path of rooms and kill everything in your way. Ammo, while it can be picked up at certain checkpoints, is limited. What's also interesting about Battle Mode is its additional new content. There are brand new music tracks for it. One plays during its basic gameplay, another quick one plays during the victory pose scene, the final one plays during the results screen. On top of that, there are two completely new enemies, exclusive to battle mode. You ironically fight hunters in the caves, while they're replaced by new enemies in the story mode, but you do see something interesting later on. The first is Zombie Wesker. He has far more health than standard zombies do, and attacks aggressively. Despite his high health, he still succumbs to a shotgun headshot. Finally, there's the boss of the whole thing. Battle mode takes you through the game's normal bosses, Yawn, Plant 42, and Black Tiger, but the final boss is not just a tyrant, but a golden one, and his health is absolutely ridiculous. The normal tyrant goes down with a few magnum shots, but the gold one takes forever. When you finally beat him, though, you complete the mode. Nothing is unlocked for beating battle mode, it's just there for fun. You can try beating your high score, both with Chris and Jill, who have different weapon loadouts. One kindness of the game is that if you ever run out of ammo for every weapon you have, then you'll instantly die, rather than have to wait to be killed for the mode to end. The only other thing to mention for Resident Evil on the Saturn is that this version gets a special mention in the end credits, and it certainly deserves it. Now the Saturn version might look like it stands out the most among the various Resident Evil ports, but just wait until you see the PC release. The first thing you'll see when you launch the PC version is a logo showing that the game is Rendition Ready, indicating the company Rendition, a maker of computer graphics chipsets back in the 90s, and boy does it show. The PC release of Resident Evil has the best presentation of the bunch. Character models don't look polygonal like on the PS1, the game's visuals really shine here. While it can be played with the keyboard, it also supports a joypad. 
In fact, the README file recommends that a joypad be used, just in case you experience what is known as ghosting with a keyboard. This is when holding down multiple keys causes one to override the other, instead of both functions activating. After launching the game, you can go to an options menu where you can set your controls. Unlike a lot of options menus where everything is in text, you can actually see what your character looks like when performing the action you're setting. It reminds me of American McGee's Alice's options menu. As for actually starting the game, well, remember how I said that America managed to get an uncensored version of Resident Evil? Well, the PC releases it. Not only is the opening movie complete, but it is also in full color, which even the Japanese PS1 release can't boast. Other parts of the game are also uncensored. Chris smokes in his ending, and Kenneth's head is still seen falling to the ground. The violent credits for having beaten the game after unlocking the rocket launcher are present as well. Speaking of unlocking the rocket launcher, the PC version of Resident Evil 2 is a strange quirk. Normally, to unlock it, you need to beat the game in under three hours. However, on PC, as far as I know, you can take as long as you want, as long as you beat the game without saving once. I tested this. I beat the game once in under three hours after having saved, and did not get the rocket launcher. I also beat the game in over three hours with no saves, and unlocked it just fine. This is definitely a challenge. No mistakes allowed. Now, after all this, other than the intro movie being in color, I haven't actually addressed unique in-game content. Well, I was able to find five things. The first is one of the more noticeable quirks. You can skip door opening sequences when you change rooms. This makes going from room to room far more efficient than it otherwise would be. The next change is the scene where a character plays Moonlight Sonata to unlock a secret area. There's a very small change. The character stops playing it at a different time than usual. The other version stopped at a part where the note made sense, but the rhythm felt a bit off. In the PC version, there's a bit more finality to the stopping point. Another change is in the puzzle in the art gallery. I've already addressed that the Saturn release had different texts on the final picture, but the PC version's different still. Instead of the end of life in the PS1 release, or give me the peace of death and I'll give you the joy of life in the Saturn version, the PC version instead has no title for the image at all, but rather a description of it. A picture of people mourning for the dead. As far as unlockables go, like other special versions of Resident Evil, the PC version has exclusive costumes in addition to the normal ones for each. Jill's looks kind of like her normal extra costume, except with a red top instead of a black one and denim cutoffs rather than long pants. Chris's new extra costume also looks kind of similar to his old extra one, except that instead of a brown Made in Heaven jacket, he has a blue Blue Bomber Bomber jacket, and he also wears a tie. Note that if you select these costumes, then while you can change into the other unlockable costume, you cannot change back into your original one. The clothing rack just says Old Clothes and doesn't give you the option to change. The last piece of unique content for the PC release is probably the most surprising, as I'm only aware of it in the American version. I was told that the English version doesn't have this. Strangely, the American version, despite coming out about two weeks before the European one did, has the new Virgin interactive logo with the eye, instead of the old static image one that the European version had. Also, the README file is called US README, implying that there may be some differences between it and its peer. Beating the game unlocks a special weapon for the character you beat it with, which starts in their inventory upon a subsequent playthrough. This seems to be regardless of time or number of saves, as when I experimented to see if the rocket launcher would unlock, both attempts unlocked these other weapons. This isn't the Cult Python from the director's cut, either. These weapons are only available on American PC. Jill gets an Ingram submachine gun with infinite ammo, Chris gets a Mini-Me light machine gun, also with infinite ammo. The 
PC version certainly is charming and quirky, but if you thought that these versions were strange, just wait until you see what's waiting for you on the DS release. Resident Evil Deadly Silence, or DS for short, is an interesting version to say the least. And not only because it was the first game for the system rated M for Mature in the United States. Like the director's cut on the PS1, Deadly Silence is effectively two games in one. There's a direct port of the original release called Classic Mode, and also a Rebirth Mode, which has a lot of changes. Before selecting either, you can go to the options menu and set the blood color to either red or green. Starting the game provides you with a different voice from what is normally heard. Usually we get this. Resident Evil. But now we get this. Resident Evil DS. The game is now fully subtitled. In addition to that, when you start a new game, you'll see that once again, Jill and Chris are each labeled in order of difficulty. Chris is still considered hard mode, but rather than easy, Jill is now normal. Unfortunately, as far as graphical presentation is concerned, the game was designed to be played on the DS's small screens, so the graphics are noticeably worse than in other releases, especially during FMV cutscenes. However, that's a relatively small price to pay for what else this game's presentation has to offer. When you pick up notes, it's like the original Japanese PS1 release. You can actually see what you're reading in the background, instead of just a black background. As far as censorship is concerned, the opening cinematic is censored and in black and white, but Kenneth's decapitation is uncensored. For more general presentation, from the title screen it's easy to see that the game makes use of the DS's two screens. There isn't much to see from the title screen and opening cinematic, but if you try to load a save file, you'll see the standard information on the bottom screen, but more detailed information on the top one, like which mode you're playing, the date and time, and the number of saves. Once the game starts, the dual screens really shine. The bottom screen is where gameplay and inventory management take place, but the top screen constantly shows a map of the area. It's actually better than manually checking the map, as the top screen tracks your movement so you can see exactly where you are at all times. It also gives a constant character status update. The area outside the map starts off gray, but as your character gets hurt, it shifts to yellow for caution, orange for the next level of caution, red for danger, and purple for poison status. Furthermore, it shows on the lower right what weapon is currently equipped and how much ammo it has. Touchscreen is also supported. You can manage your inventory that way if it's easier for you. Another useful feature of the DS is that you can skip dialogue scenes. And, like the PC version, you can skip door opening animations, allowing for a much more streamlined gameplay experience than other versions can boast. An additional convenience is that the knife doesn't take up an inventory slot. You can equip and slash with it at any time. Characters can also do a 180 degree quick turn by holding the run button and pressing down. This was impossible in the original Resident Evil. A quick reload option is now available as well. In the original game, you had to combine ammo with your gun in the inventory screen. A couple of odd quirks are that the piano playing scene stops at the same part of the music that it does in the PC release. Also, the save room music is in a slightly different key than in other releases. There's also a particularly strange change that makes use of the stylus. You can poke your character in certain places. Ah. Ah. If it's of any consolation, the game offers equal opportunity sexual harassment. Huh? Now for some features exclusive to Rebirth Mode. One notable example is that if you're grabbed by a zombie, you can mash buttons or interact with the touchscreen to shake it off of you and knock it down. Also, some room layouts have been changed. One instance is in the room before the changing room. It has a big mirror you can see yourself in when you enter. This is reminiscent of the advanced mode in the PS1 Director's Cut. Speaking of the changing room, there are costumes unique to the DS version. Like the PS1 Director's Cut, playing normal mode will only grant access to the original unlockable costumes, but Rebirth Mode allows the new ones as well. Also, like the Director's Cut, the layout of the changing room is different from the one in Classic Mode, though the DS version looks still different from Advanced Modes. Jill gets a sexy cop uniform, while Chris gets a ninja outfit. If Chris wears his ninja uniform, then Rebecca gets a costume change as well. She dresses as a cheerleader, and her knife is replaced with a pom-pom. 
Still another similarity to advanced mode in the director's cut is that the pistol can sometimes decapitate enemies. The knife is potentially more dangerous too. Sometimes when you change rooms, the game switches to a first person view where you can't move, but you can stab or swipe at oncoming enemies with a stylus or your finger. Attack just as the enemy is about to for a devastating critical hit. Sometimes winning these fights will yield an item to compensate for the added difficulty. Speaking of using the stylus and microphone, there are new puzzles specifically designed for them. There may be new chests, for example, that require using the stylus to properly open them. Other interactivity has been used to augment puzzles that already existed, but didn't need it. Normally when you put the gold emblem where the wooden one used to be, the clock in the dining room would chime and reveal a key. This time, you have to wind the clock yourself. Similarly, if you save Richard with serum, instead of that being the end of the situation, you have to use your microphone to give him CPR. If you save him, he even tells you to wind the dining room clock to a different time to get a bonus item. Probably one of my favorite features, though, is something rather subtle. There are some rooms where you might encounter more than one enemy type at the same time. This never happened in the original Resident Evil. If you saw one type of enemy, then that would be all you get for that room. In Rebirth mode, however, you may encounter both crows and zombies, or both dogs and zombies, for example. It's a surprising change to something that I never noticed when I first played Resident Evil. Finally, Deadly Silence offers two additional modes. One is unlocked by beating the main game, Master of Knifing, a nod to the infamous Master of Unlocking line from Jill's campaign. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the Master of Unlocking, take it with you. This mode is a series of rooms where you have to knife every enemy that comes your way. It has a unique music track as well. As it's a gauntlet, it's kind of like the battle mode from the Saturn version. Again, you stab or slash at enemies with a stylus or your finger, and you can use the microphone to repel projectile attacks. As is the case in the main campaign, Chris's mode is harder than Jill's. Beating this mode unlocks Wesker as a playable character in Deadly Silence's final mode, multi-card mode. Yes, Resident Evil actually has multiplayer, with its own unique music. If you have Wi-Fi and are near other people with their own copies of the game, then you can choose to play a co-op campaign where you all share a life bar and have to escape the area, or a competitive mode to see who completes their area first. You can choose among the mansion, the guardhouse, and the lab area. And if everyone's unlocked, then you have a wide cast of characters to choose from. There's Chris, Barry, Wesker, Forrest, Enrico, Richard, Kenneth, Rebecca, and Jill. They also have mostly unique sound bits when you select them. Okay. Rebecca's, though, sounds like it was taken from her first appearance in the main story. Yes, sir. I'll do my best. All right. Let's do it. Yes, sir. I'll do my best. Well, Resident Evil on the DS sure was fun to talk about, but there's actually one more version of the game. The Game Boy Color version. Now, don't let the box fool you. This is a fan-made reproduction cart. This game was never completed and never officially released. Despite its presentation suffering from technical limitations, this is a surprisingly faithful interpretation of Resident Evil. The famous Resident Evil voice in the beginning of the game plays when the menu appears, rather than when you choose to start a new game or continue an old one. You still get to pick Chris or Jill, and the game even goes through the opening cutscene, with subtitles instead of spoken dialogue. The music is different as well. In fact, there's only one track in the entire game. Certain liberties have been taken to make the game playable, such as the table in the dining room being removed so it's possible to walk around, the initial zombie cutscene being reduced to a single screenshot, and zombies dropping to their knees instead of completely falling to the floor when killed. But even so, this game is definitely Resident Evil. There's decent scaling to show depth on each of the screens, camera shots that change when focusing on certain items like the emblem in the dining room, scene transitions like door opening and stair climbing screens, and even idle animations, or stills. It's also still possible to move objects, like the stairs in the map room on the first floor. 
The status screen and inventory management are the same as always, though being able to manipulate 3D objects is not an option. The only time this actually matters in the game is when investigating the Doom books to get the medals inside, but in this version, just clicking the check button will take care of that. Interestingly, in addition to going to the inventory screen to pause gameplay, this version actually has a unique pause screen with the Stars logo. You also have infinite ammo for whatever gun you equip. To my knowledge, this game is unbeatable. I've heard that it's about 90% complete, but from what I've been able to find, it's possible to make it only to a certain point before having to use some sort of cheat or manipulation on an emulator to get past it, but even then, while it's possible to make it to the elevator that leads to the final encounter in the lab and even power it on, despite that, the game will still say that the elevator has no power, so the last few rooms of the game are inaccessible. Also, the only enemies you appear to be able to fight are zombies. I haven't seen any other enemy type in the game, with the single exception of Yawn, and then only in the room where you fight it for the first time, but Yawn doesn't move at all. That said, nearly all characters, cutscenes, and puzzles appear to be present. This game may be incomplete and unreleased, but this has got to be one of the most ambitious Game Boy Color games, and even ports in general, of all time. The attention to detail and ways of navigating limitations are just incredible. It would have been cool to see the final product, but it's great that we have what we do. Speaking of which, an earlier release of this version has actually been found. It looks like some kind of test copy. You can only play as Chris, even if you select Jill, and he starts with the map and shotgun. After collecting the emblem, it's impossible to check the hollow recess where it once was. Apparently it hadn't yet been programmed in. It's cool to see things like this, an earlier look at what could have been. Well, there you have it. Every version of the original Resident Evil. However, we're not done yet. This game was remade in 2002 for the Nintendo GameCube. This game is an absolute masterpiece. It's a perfect example of the same but different. For starters, whether you choose Chris or Jill, you can still set the difficulty to easy or medium, and unlock hard after you beat the game. Of course the presentation got a complete overhaul, with gorgeous attention to detail, including new lighting effects. Most cutscenes are now skippable, but boy have they been improved. Speaking of cutscenes, Capcom has a love for fan service and self-referential humor, and it shows. This game has several nods to some of the more well-known lines in the original game. Stop it! Don't open that door! Jill, no. You don't want to go back out there. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Barry, thanks for saving my life! That was a close one. A second late. You would have fit nicely into a sandwich. Really? Thanks. Not all lines were given the nod, though. In the remake, if you're playing as Chris and you've saved Rebecca, then you could take her with you into the Tyrant Lab. In the original Resident Evil, she was left in the hallway outside and so did not have context for what went down there. Because of this change, we lost probably the funniest line in the original Resident Evil. How about Captain Wesker? He is sleeping with the ultimate failure. My favorite bit of fun, though, is toward the end of the game, when you put the MO discs into their readers. In the original Resident Evil, they just look like nondescript machines. In the remake, though, they look like GameCube consoles. Fan service aside, though, there's a lot to talk about. There's new music. There are entirely new areas, like the cemetery. There are new gameplay mechanics, like quick turning, and characters visibly showing that they're injured. There are new items. There are subversions of expectations. There are new bosses, like the Crimson Head Elder and Lisa Trevor. Pre-existing boss fights have been overhauled, like Plant 42, which now takes place on two floors, and Neptune, which has been turned into a sort of puzzle fight. Some zombies can now open doors, though those encounters are scripted. Other puzzles have been changed, and new ones have been added. There's a lot more to do with manipulation of 3D items in the inventory screen than there was in the original Resident Evil. There are additional endings, as Rebecca or Barry, if saved, joins you in the final boss fight, the results of which change depending on whether your partner survives. However, then there are the really major changes to the game. For starters, you can now find defense items. 
Each character has two kinds. Both get daggers, Jill gets a battery pack for a taser, and Chris gets grenades to shove in enemies' mouths. The taser does decent damage, while the grenade is an instant kill. I particularly enjoy the daggers, though, just because of a surprising new gameplay mechanic. The dagger is shoved into an enemy's head to make it let go of the character. If a zombie is stabbed in this manner, and then decapitated with a headshot, the dagger will actually fall to the ground, and can be picked up again. Probably my favorite major change in the game is what's been done with the lighter. The lighter was next to useless in the original game, which was a shame, as it was Chris's permanent inventory item, likely a nod to him smoking in the original uncensored cutscene. It had exactly two uses in the entire game, getting the map on the second floor of the mansion, and lighting a candle in the upstairs dining room so you could see some ammo you could pick up. You can easily beat the game without ever using the lighter, or even entering that upper dining room. In the remake, however, the lighter is immensely useful. It still serves those same purposes, though its use in the upper dining room is actually mandatory this time around, as the hidden item you get is a half of the sheet music of Moonlit Sonata. Yeah, the sheet music is in two pieces now. The lighter is otherwise unnecessary for its intended purpose, but then there's been an entirely new mechanic added to the game. In the original Resident Evil, if you leave a room after having killed enemies and returning will show that their bodies have disappeared. In the remake, zombies' bodies remain upon re-entering locations. This is because many zombies are no longer properly dead after being taken down. Now, after a certain point in the game is reached, if a zombie is killed, after several minutes, it will rise again as the infamous Crimson Head. These things are nasty. They're faster and angrier than before, and make the game a lot more difficult. To deal with Crimson Heads, you either have to kill them all over again, or make sure they never show up at all. When you're fighting a zombie, if you happen to decapitate it, then your job is over. If you don't, then this is where the lighter comes in handy. After a normal zombie is brought down, then if you have the lighter in your inventory, you can use a brand new item, the Fuel Canteen, as long as it's been filled with kerosene found in limited amounts in various areas of the game, to burn the corpse, preventing it from rising again. The addition of Crimson Heads keeps the game stressful, even when you're in a room you thought you'd cleared. This is especially true because not every zombie rises as a Crimson Head, so each time you pass a body, you have to wonder if you're getting a lucky break if nothing happens, or if you'll pay later for dropping your guard. The lighter, with its new use, remains worthy of staying in your inventory, even right up until the end of the game. Also, if you're playing as Jill, then note that her grenade launcher's incendiary rounds will burn zombies they kill, eliminating the need to light their bodies up later. Speaking of the grenade launcher, it no longer has a maximum ammo capacity for whatever type of grenade is loaded in it, and you can swap ammo types whenever you want. As a matter of fact, this mechanic can be exploited. There's a glitch that, as far as I know, is only present in the GameCube version of the remake, as it may have been fixed in future releases. With Jill, make sure that you have a loaded grenade launcher and ammo taking up a separate inventory slot. Go to an item box, empty your inventory, put the grenade launcher in the top left slot of your inventory, and put the ammo in the top right slot. Exit the box and equip the grenade launcher. Open the box again, highlight the ammo and put it in the box. It doesn't have to be an empty slot, just press the confirm button twice, once to select the ammo, and again to place it. Then, go to the ammo in the item box, select it, and try to swap it with your grenade launcher. You'll find that your ammo will greatly multiply. This makes even runs on hard mode quite easy, as acid rounds quickly take down hunters, and incendiary rounds quickly and permanently take down zombies. As for intended secrets and unlockables, there are new weapons. Well, okay, the first one isn't exactly unlockable, but in the guardhouse you can find a gun that has exactly one bullet. However, it's really strong. Then there's the Assault Shotgun, a superior shotgun with greater ammo capacity than the original. The Assault Shotgun isn't unlockable, but it's kind of a secret. You get it from Richard, the guy you had to cure of Yawn's poison early in the game. If you're playing as Jill, then if you save him and do enough damage to Yawn in your first fight with it, a cutscene will happen and he'll drop it. If you're Chris, then if you save Richard, he'll show up in the Aqua Ring and drop the gun for you to pick up later when the place is drained. Another secret is Barry's gun. During the final Lisa Trevor encounter, you can choose not to return his gun to him. If you choose to hold on to it, then you can pick it up during or after the fight. It's quite good. It can one-shot even the tyrant in the lab. Now for actual unlockables. If you beat the game in under 5 hours, then you get the Samurai Edge pistol for both characters. It has infinite ammo and can fire 3 shots in rapid succession. You still unlock a rocket launcher for both characters upon beating the game in 3 hours, but it's not the one that you use in the final boss fight. 
you get a different model, which can be aimed up and down, and can kill anything in one hit. Those zombies still have to be burned. They're not obliterated like they would be from a rocket in the original game, so Crimson Heads can still pop back up. For more unlockables, there are the costumes. Chris and Jill have two new costumes each. Simply beat the game once with them to get the closet key and the first costume, and a second time to get the other costume. The changing room is now toward the beginning of the game, behind a painting in the hallway past the statue with the map. Jill's first costume is combat-style clothing, and her second is her primary outfit from Resident Evil 3. Chris gets streetwear for his first costume, and his Code Veronica uniform for his second. Also, with Chris's new costumes comes a new one for Rebecca. She gets a cowgirl outfit. Besides costumes, there are also new game modes. Beat the game once on normal difficulty to unlock real survival mode. This one is no joke. The difficulty is set to hard, auto-aim has been removed, and arguably most importantly, item boxes are no longer linked. If you want to get an item you put in a box, then you'd better go back and find that box. Beating the game on real survival mode, or twice on any difficulty, unlocks invisible enemy mode, where enemies are completely invisible except for in two scenarios. The first is if they grab you, they'll fade into view until you throw them off. The second is reflections. There are several points in the remake where you'll run over puddles of water or in front of mirrors, and invisible enemies reflect in both. It can be an unnerving experience when you first see this. Also, as enemies are invisible, there is no auto-aim. That would spoil the fun. The final thing to unlock permanently affects the game. It can't be turned off. You'll have to start a new file to avoid this one. It's one tough zombie. Remember Forrest Spayer, the Dead Stars member on the second floor? He'll attack you if you walk past him to get a healing item, but in One Tough Zombie, he isn't in that room at all. That's because he's walking around. He's in several preset areas of the mansion, and he makes life quite difficult. He has the speed of a crimson head, but dies in just one hit. That sounds all well and good, except that he dies in one hit because he's strapped with grenades. If he dies, then you do too. You cannot fight him. If he grabs you, then just let him bite, because fighting back will result in an instant game over. Have fun looking for him, or maybe he'll find you instead. Well, it sure was fun talking about the remake, but there are a few different versions of it, too. We'll start with the Wii port. The Wii port is nearly identical to the GameCube version, so there really isn't much to talk about. There are only three things to mention that I'm aware of. The first is that the game can be played in 480p, rather than the GameCube version's 480i. There are also new controls. In addition to the GameCube controller, you can use the Wii Remote, a combination of the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, or the classic controller. Finally, toward the end of the game, when you enter the lab, in the GameCube version, you're prompted to switch to Disc 2. The Wii version, however, is on just one disc, so the gameplay is seamless at this part. That's really it for the Wii release, so now it's time to enter the world of HD. In 2015, Resident Evil's remake was finally released in HD. It's available on the PS3, Xbox 360, PS4, Xbox One, and PC via Steam. As far as in-game content goes, they're all identical. The only real differences I can talk about are specs. The PS3 and 360 versions have a resolution of 720p. The PS4 and Xbox One are presented in 1080, but at 30 frames per second. The PC version is in 1080 and 60 frames per second. Those are the only differences among the HD versions that I'm aware of. As for how the remaster compares to the original remake, there are a few things to talk about. For starters, there's the main menu. You can view a digital manual here, as well as check out a gallery for ending cutscenes you unlock, and online leaderboards to compare times for speedruns. You can also set the display language and subtitles. A new difficulty level, very easy, is available from the start, where ink ribbon pickups are worth 6 instead of the usual 3. When starting a new game, you can select which costume you'd like your character to wear. Their normal unlockable costumes still have to be unlocked by beating the game, but on a new game plus, they can be chosen here though the option to use the changing room is still available. However, even on a new file, both Chris and Jill have a brand new costume. They're BSAA outfits from Resident Evil 5. During actual gameplay, you can set the display mode. This is very considerate of the developers. 
The remake was originally made for the GameCube, which was designed to play on CRT TVs with a 4x3 aspect ratio. To port this game to HD systems, and likely HD TVs, meant that it would have to maintain the aspect ratio and have black bars on the sides of the screen. Either that, or it would have to stretch the image to fill the screen, but distort proportions. However, the remaster gives you the option to either maintain the aspect ratio or have the game set to widescreen, where the screen is filled with proper proportions, but going to the edge of a screen will have the camera pan in that direction. It's a clever addition. Speaking of presentation, as the game is in HD, details are much more accentuated than before, and minute details are easier to perceive. The game also now has achievements, giving it additional replay value. When it comes to entering the lab, as was the case with the Wii release, there is no need to change discs. The HD games run either on Blu-ray, which is far more storage space than a GameCube disc, or as downloadable titles, where there are no discs at all, so it's no surprise that the transition into the lab is seamless. When it comes to gameplay mechanics, as was the case with the DS release of Resident Evil 1, the remaster has conveniently added tactical reloading. In addition to being able to reload your weapons by combining them with ammo in the inventory screen, you can also hold the aim button and press the cancel button to reload during gameplay. When you unlock a new weapon or mode, the caption text has been changed. When you unlock the Samurai Edge, for example, the GameCube version simply says, Chris and Jill now have this, which may be a nod to Barry's line in the original Resident Evil. But how about you, Barry? I have this. The remaster, however, tells you that you got Barry's custom Samurai Edge, and also adds, It's really powerful. What is it? It's a weapon. It's really powerful. Another change is of the end screen itself. When you beat the original versions of the remake, you fade in to a still image of your character and you get a display showing how much time it took to beat the game. In the remaster version, there are some differences. Instead of fading in as a part of the background, your character pans in front of it. As for the background itself, in addition to showing the final time, you also get how much ammo and how many ink ribbons and health items you used. And as for why the character pans in front of the background, that's because there are new images, one for each costume the character was wearing at the time he beat the game. One of my favorite changes, though, is the MO disc reader. It no longer looks like a GameCube, but you can kind of tell that it used to be one. The power, reset, and disc tray open buttons have been removed, but you can still see ports with what could only be the ends of GameCube controller wires hooked up to them. Overall, Resident Evil's remake looks even more gorgeous than ever. This is a masterful port that keeps what made the game good, and adds some tweaks to make it even better. Well, there you have it. That was every version of Resident Evil 1 and its remake. This was a lot to talk about. If I had to choose a favorite version, I'd probably go with the original director's cut of PS1. I prefer its soundtrack to the DualShock releases. Now, I like the director's cut because it's basically two games in one. You have Original Mode and Advanced. Now, the DS also has two Resident Evil games, but it also has Master of Knifing, Multiplayer, and the ability to skip cutscenes and door opening screens. And it's portable, so there is that to consider as well. The PC version has by far the best presentation, so it's really a matter of what you prioritize. As far as the remake, one of the HD versions. Personally, I would go with PS4, Xbox One, or Steam. I like PS4 because of the convenience of console. I don't have an Xbox One, but either way, they're effectively the same thing. The PC does have slightly better FPS. It is 60 FPS instead of 30, but as this is an old-school Resident Evil game, FPS isn't exactly required for a proper gameplay experience. The original game was released in, you know, not 60 FPS anyway. Regardless, though, whatever version you do choose, you're going to have a good time. Thank you very much for watching this video and going on this journey with me. I hope it was fun as well as educational, and I hope that the Resident Evil series continues to offer amazing games in the future. Until next time, everyone.